Trio five. Number eight, Dean County. Y'all already know what time it is. Throw them use up. Throw them use up. We gonna let the band deal with this. Hey guys, welcome back to. I guess we're going to Tyler's Corner. Yep, welcome to Tyler's Don't Corner. Very honed in on me, I guess. But uh, this one's going to be about North Carolina versus Miami. We're going to preview that and talk about what North Carolina's got going on. Andrew's got some stuff about North Carolina. Oh, I have some stuff on – I have a lot. I don't know what Andrew's got is the reason. So – yeah, and I then, think you actually have more stuff on North Carolina than I do. Yeah. So. Uh, which North Carolina is the only team, one of the only teams in the ACC now that, it, on our side anyway, that I don't really know anything about other than Georgia Tech. Because Georgia Tech is completely different. North Carolina is now completely different yeah, yeah, than what they were. all the changes, yeah. So I did my due diligence and made sure I found something cool. about them. So they – I don't know, like – where to start from this because I don't really have like a record on North Carolina or Miami because um, North Carolina is very historically beating, has been beating Miami in the ACC with North Carolina having not mediocre talent but I would say just they're good they've always been solid Yeah. Um, for Miami, North Carolina has always been that team that's like it's they're not rivals but they're always going to give each other a run for their money, no matter what, how good the other one is. Like, I know that year they had, like, Eric Ebron and crew. They were pretty good. And then Miami was terrible, and we gave them a solid run for their money. Even though we were ranked higher, they were a better team. And it's, there's teams like that all around the country. I think, like, Alabama, Mississippi State is one of those that's, like, not a rival, but it'll be a good game. Yeah. And it's going to yeah. be tough for both schools. They're going to not want to make sure they lose to each other or anything like that. So A great thing, too, is you've got a lot of familiarity going on with the coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's the Tar Heels O-line coach. Was it Miami the last couple years? Really? Yeah. And Stacy Searle? Oh, that's right. Yeah, he's, he's the Tar Heels O-line coach now. If you're a Miami fan, you know who Stacy Searle is, and God bless. So <laughs> Joker was terrible. Uh, so Joker was terrible. And it was hilarious because I'm like – Okay, Miami the last couple years has uh, been terrible at offensive line and is showing currently. We're terrible so at recruiting. He's, now he's with the Tar Heels, and it's like – and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Brown wor- has worked with Diaz before. Yeah. What's uh, – we'll just jump into the recruiting. Cool. We'll just jump, like, talk about just what these teams got overall. So we're not going to, like, dive into who's who in the recruiting rankings – yeah. Other than Sam Howell, of course, because that's our quarterback right now. But they, in 2016, they were 32nd in the country in recruiting and fourth in the ACC – or fifth, sorry. 2017, it was 29th in the country, fifth in the ACC again. 18 was 20th. They jumped way up. Larry Fedora is arguably his – not arguably, but that is one of his better recruitment classes as a whole. But he then tops it off with going to a nine – in 2018, so they fire him, rightfully so, because he went 2-9. and nine. Yeah. And then 2019, they went back to their average 29 with fifth in the ACC. But while they had a 20th ring in the country in 2018, they were still fourth in the ACC, which is, I mean, I don't know. You're definitely behind Miami. and Clemson's number one, and then you're obviously behind Miami. Yeah. And then uh, who else is in there? I wouldn't really know other than maybe – Florida State, probably. That would be my guess. So, just to bring up Miami's classes is kind of a comparison. Miami in 2016, uh, we were 16th. That is Mark Rick's first year in the country. And that would be third in the ACC. 2017 was arguably one of his better classes, even though it's ranked lower. Is uh, was 12th in the country. We were second in the ACC. Uh, 2018, we were eight. 2018 was a killer class with rankings and stuff, but it was very top-heavy. Um, that was the Brevin Jordan, Will Mallory, Lorenzo Lingard, Cam Harris, Jaron Williams, that class, yeah. which is all dudes that are making immense impacts right now. 
And then 2019 was a product of what was happening around our program, which is seven to six. We were 27th in the country. We were fourth in the ACC. So with, you gotta, in retrospect, North Carolina goes two and nine, and we're barely above them in rankings <laughs> yeah. in the yeah. ACC, if you really think about it like that. Even though our number is barely bigger than theirs, which is 29th, we're 27. Last year, our recruiting classes were terrible, which showed because both of our records were Miami had – was supposed to be up here, and we weren't. North Carolina is that average team, and they were well below average of even their standards, much less just anybody else's. Yeah, and uh, it's really showing. But that just makes the point too: is you know you've got two new, which you know Mac Brown has a lot of experience, but they're both fresh. Yeah, I think both of these teams are starting over in a yeah. sense in the ACC. But you have a lot of teams you like have that. two head coaches that are fresh that are basically given mm-hmm. what they've what they've got. Yeah, you know, and they're working with what they've got, and you know, and from the Manny's in a the Manny's in a years. yeah Manny's in a very much so a better spot than Mac Brown is. Oh, absolutely. But uh, I know that's not what you were saying, but it's a uh, it's definitely the ACC as a whole is like restructuring. You got Florida yeah. State yeah. who was up here, and now they're going down, and I don't know when they're exactly going to come back up after week one. No. But then you got Georgia Tech, who went from wing T triple option to now they're running a spread, and it shows when they played Clemson. Did you watch the Clemson game? I didn't. Because Travis Etienne ran for like 300 yards all over him, and Georgia Tech is – they're switching completely. They're a – they're the one that it doesn't matter what their record is. If they go 0 and 11, you take your hands up and you say, yeah, this is understood. And then Virginia Tech is getting out of the Frank Beamer – era and they've got nobody and they're trying to and you got Miami now out of the Mark Richt era which Miami fans is like finally but Miami is not there in the ACC yet so it's just literally it's going to be Clemson at the top for I would say without contest for I say at least the two or three years and I think it's up to these two teams especially both being in the coastal as to who how tough this conference really winds up getting because North Carolina is usually the one that used to win the Coastal when they had Butch Davis. And um, I think it's up to these two teams to really hone in this Coastal and say, yeah, we're, it's not just Clemson. Yeah, so. yeah. And I, I think that this game is going to be a great game for the ACC. Yeah. Um, because after that, it's just going to be. Well, it's one of the first ACC games on ACC Network. Oh, that's right. Which they is re- new. Yeah, they, they recently. So if you don't have direct TV, I think there's now it's only one. I think it's Cox Cable. It's one of the only. There's only one cable provider now that doesn't have the ACC network. But, like, I think it was Dish did not have uh, oh, ACC okay. network. But if you have uh, a DirecTV login, you can watch it online and stuff like that. But we'll get into uh, more of the team that North Carolina has just because they've got – I don't know if they're – we've talked about Miami enough. I guess it, we'll just start with North Carolina. Yeah. They, they get Mac Brown – which was really surprising because he was commentating, not commenting, he was being an analyst, which is what Mark Rick's currently doing. And I thought he was fairly good at it. He was good at, like, he knew what coaches obviously wanted and what players wanted. And he's very much a player's coach. And yeah. they hire him, and he just – he's has a coach since 2013 where he had been at Texas since 19 – let me take it make sure I check it out right. Since 1997. From 1997 to 2013, he had been in Texas. He had Vince Young. He had Colt McCoy. He had a pretty good stable of teams. And then before that, he was at North Carolina, which yeah. I didn't really know. Was obviously because a little younger. Yeah. But he yeah. was from – he was at UNC from 1988 to 1997, which is a, honestly a really long stint. Yeah. I don't know how good North Carolina was during that time, but – I mean, of the schools that come to my mind, it's usually not yeah. North Carolina. So, um, then he gets at Texas, and he just – Texas kind of falls off. You see Texas A&M rise and with Johnny Manziel and that team. And he kind of – he just – he just – he retires. Got to do it. And then, uh, surprisingly, he gets hired back. So, they're not hired – well, I guess hired back, yeah, to come back to North Carolina – 
And he's not, I don't know if he ever did at Texas. I'm pretty sure he didn't. He's like, I don't want no part of the play calling. I don't want to do any of this. I just want a CEO. Like, I'll be the head coach. I'll be the figurehead. And then my two coordinators, who will, two defense coordinators, are co-coordinators, and my offensive coordinator are just going to run the team. And uh, Yeah, and I think what's interesting, too, is the contrast between Manny Diaz and Mac Brown. Yeah. Uh, when I watch I, – I spend a lot of time now watching the uh, their YouTube channels because they have yeah. great yeah. – Great YouTube channels. And <laughs> I, I don't know if you watched the, the interview post-game with Mac Brown against the Gamecocks after they won. Yeah, he was very emotional. He just started crying. Yeah. And I'm like, this guy is like the player's grandpa. Yeah. Like, he was happy like a little kid. Did you yeah. see him? They made him dance after the game. Yeah. And He's always <laughs> been one like that. He was so embarrassed because he was doing some kind of uh, – like uh, something yeah, like that, like a crossing guard, and it was horrible. But you know, we'll yeah. work on that. But it's amazing to see the contrast. Um, yeah, Mac Brown being like the, like you said, the players' coach, mm-hmm. and then Manny Diaz being like the iron fist. And it's like yeah. just interesting how to, to see how that's going to play out. Well, I think very, uh, Manny's a very interesting blend between with like somebody like what Jimmy Johnson did really well is he was like for the players. But ultimately, he was in charge, like, and not the, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. the de facto for everything. Yeah, this is my team. And then you got somebody like Mac Brown, like, I'm just the dad. And then, or I'm, I guess, <laughs> in this sense, I would be grandpa. And then, coordinators are your dads. Like, I, you don't have to talk to me because I really don't know what you're doing. <laughs> like, it's just you guys. And then I'm the recruiter and I'm the scheme builder, and that's it. Yeah. Like, I don't care about the day-to-day work of the team. And he's very much just a player's coach. And uh, I think it will wind up benefiting that team in the long run, especially in North Carolina. A pretty yeah. Good school and, for recruiting. And Mac Brown goes on to say that, you know, they were nervous with Hal being, you mm-hmm. know, he's a freshman. But he said towards the end of the game, he just put the ball in his hands. Yeah. He just let him have it. Where Manny Diaz on the sideline – Miami versus Florida is in the defense's face, which we yeah. talked about that last week. I just still love that image mm-hmm. of Manny Diaz with the Roy Ridge. But it just shows you the difference in mm. in style. Yeah. Um, but that's interesting. Uh, Manny Diaz actually gave a press conference, which, you know, on his takeaway with Mac Brown and the experience of working with him. And he goes on to say, well, he won a lot of games and had success winning games. When you get on one of those runs like he had at Texas, it can look easy and it is never easy. Like you do with every head coach, you learn how they run the ins and the outs of the program and incorporate them into your program. There's some procedural stuff that I took from Mac Brown. The way you engage people around your program, those are some of the things that he had a great knack for. Some of the things on the inside that are trade secrets that you don't really talk about, you know. Yeah, I mean, Mac Brown was one of the better coaches of his time frame at his at Texas to really do what he was doing because it wasn't until Alabama came along that there wasn't really much competition to what Texas was doing because Texas has their – they had the Longhorn Network. They were, like, building this stuff up. Yeah. And they weren't – and then you see kind of Saban building – I don't know if it's Saban necessarily, but they're like – SEC's like, we'll make our own network to combat with the powerhouse that is Texas. Yeah. And – but it really does look easy when you have somebody like Vince Young and you upset one of the greatest teams ever, apparently, in USC, which is very much a knock to Miami fans. But then there's um, – he goes to play Alabama, and then Alabama beats him because Cole McCoy gets hurt in, like, literally the first play in the national championship game, and Alabama just takes over. Because then Mac Brown kind of takes a step back, and then he just says, yeah, I'm done. Because ultimately, you see Alabama's. I don't know. I mean, th- listen. Whatever Alabama's doing, they're doing it right. Yeah. Because I think we've said this many times, but Alabama and Clemson could not be more opposite of each other in the way they're running. Yeah. Because you got Alabama, who Nick Saban could be winning by thirty at half, and he's still mad. Yeah. About something, he's only yeah. happy in the national championship game, and that doesn't even matter what the score is. They were losing in the Clemson game. And he's like, you know, we just got to come back out. And that's it. 
and you expected him to be really mad because they were playing terribly. Yeah. And then, you know, things happen. But I see that. I think that's where you see Mac Brown. I think almost being a 21st century head coach, where he's like, just make the players happy, and they'll wind up playing better. Where you see Manny being more of the old school, like. Yeah. You've got to play better every time. Like, yeah. you have to be better every time. And which one breeds better players, I guess we'll we'll see. Because Clemson and Alabama's are both working, and they're completely different. Yeah. They're, they're both thin to that spectrum, so I guess we'll wind up seeing. Yeah, for sure. So, I guess the only thing other thing to talk about with Mac Brown is what you said, was that Manny was there at Texas. Yeah. That was after Will Muschamp left and went to Florida. Oh, okay. So I guess the other only thing to talk about would be what you said earlier was Manny Diaz, who was there from 2011 to ultimately being relieved of his duties like after the first or second game in September, which was after Will Muschamp left and went to Florida. And um, Manny was pretty terrible at Texas, but ter- Texas was a pretty terrible team at the time. It was just like – if there was a defensive player in Texas, they were going to A and M. It was yeah. just like that was just the way the tides are turning, which is the way it is now. But I think you got Texas and A and M both coming coming up at the same time. But um, but I think that's about it with Mac Brown. I really, really, really want to talk about their offensive coordinator because yeah. he has a lot of hype surrounding him because he was at Ole Miss for the last two seasons, and he had. His first season would have been with Shea Patterson, who was a like top fifty all time in recruiting. Like he's one of the top fifty prospects of all time, counting since like nineteen ninety nine or something like that. And he's a five star quarterback. He hasn't lived up to it at all, even now even though he transferred to Michigan last season. But they still had AJ Brown and DK Metcalf, who were top two round picks who were receivers, and I'm just going to just read it off just so you could just get the sense of what he's doing, at, what he was doing at Ole Miss. He produced top 20 units both years. He was at Ole Miss. At 2018, his offense ranked seventh in yards per play with seven 7.1 yards per play, ninth in total offense with 510 and a half yards per game, fifth in passing offense, which is three – 50 will round it up. 25th in red zone offense and 33rd in scoring offense with scoring 34 points a game. So the first season, I think you can kind of count as an anomaly. Because they have Shea Patterson yeah. who's running for his life and you have two the two good receivers. And then last year they have um, the Hawaiian kid. I don't even remember his name. But uh, he throws to A.J. Brown and throws to D.K. Metcalf, which both were – D.K. Metcalf was not that good, but A.J. Brown caught, like, 88 passes for, like, 1,500 yards in 12 games, which is nuts. And, uh, you know, while the numbers are impressive, it begs the question, is that a product of the talent he had? Because he's playing in the SEC, but – or is that really how good he is? Because he was, before that, he was at FCS um, and, you know, just making the playoffs in the FCS. I don't know if he won anything or not, but uh, it really just begs the question whether or not he's really good. And I guess we'll – we caught a glimpse of some of the stuff he did in the first game, which is a lot of – what he does, he's going to bring a lot of air raid packages and schemes in. I don't know – Andrew really necessarily knows the ins and outs of all that. Yeah, I don't. But the only thing I know is that uh, Mike Leach in the 1990s, the guy that yeah. was kind of like, you know, so you've got yeah. him kind of going to uh, yeah. sessions with him and, and mm-hmm. learning the ins and outs of it. So yeah. exactly because, as you guys know, I'm not the mm-hmm. uh, connoisseur of football like Tyler is. How does Air Raid stack up against Miami's defense? Well, you're going to see is a lot of like – uh, no tight end looks, like maybe four receivers. You're going to spread Miami's defense out a lot. But Miami's defense is built for it because they don't play, A, they don't play three corners, and, B, they don't play three linebackers. They play a striker. 
which is a guy that is a corner safety linebacker hybrid. Yeah. He plays at that, that 215 pound range. He's very good at Romeo Finley is the one I'm thinking of Miami's defense. He very much so is a very able able tackler. Um and then behind him it would be Zach McLeod, who they say is really fast but doesn't quite fit into the striker role, but he also can't play linebacker because you have Shaq and Pickney both playing linebacker. But um but what you're gonna see is a lot of spread out looks, a lot of flood underneath concepts, uh, a lot of mesh routes. I know you don't know exactly what that is. But they'll bring two receivers kind of on drag routes. Oh, okay. Just make sure you can't play man. But what Miami does really well is they blitz from all different angles. Yeah. But they didn't do it against Florida because Felipe Franks literally beat Michigan just by running. So Miami, we talked about this last time, but Miami was just buying a guy and say, as long as Franks can't run, I don't think this joker can beat us, which you – ultimately did by a hair. Um, yeah. And I don't know if it was all technically – one pass wasn't necessarily all him. Well, I mean, I'll go on the record to say that, that Florida won because Miami lost. True. Uh, I mean – I yeah. think that that's pretty it's much sums it up. Yeah, stroke the ego, but yeah. Um, Felipe Franks was awfully terrible, but we're not going to talk about that. But what he, they really got to do is do a – that's what he bring. that's what Phil Longo – that's his name, right? Yeah, Phil yeah. Longo yeah. is – that's what he wants to do. It's what he did at Ole Miss. But what he's going to really do at North Carolina is because they have two really good running backs. He's going to uh, – Michael Clark, Michael Carter and Antonio Williams, who both ran for over 230 yards against an SEC defense, which is coached by Will Muschamp. I think you're, they actually have two Williams at running back. Do they really? Yeah. Yeah, they have uh, Carter uh, – Javante Williams and Antonio Williams. Oh, or maybe it is Javante. So they have three actually decent running backs. Yeah. So. You've seen two used a lot in the South Carolina game. And they ran yeah. for over 230 yards against yeah. a SEC defense nonetheless. And no matter if they're at the bottom or in the middle, whatever the heck they want to say. What we really get to see is Sam Howell because um, he's kind of the core – or the centerpiece for this thing, as most quarterbacks usually are. But he was the third-ranked dual-threat uh, pocket or dual threat quarterback coming out of high school. So you're going to see a lot of RPOs where he's going to read the defensive end and either hand it off or he's going to throw it to the guy that's running a slant right behind the linebackers. So they're going to force you – they're going to just hand it off, hand it off, out of the shotgun, obviously. And then they're going to – the moment your linebackers take one step forward, their guy comes in a slant right behind where they were. And if he reads it right, that dude's open every time. Yeah. So what you got to have is what really benefits Miami in this scheme is you have Shaq and you have Pickney, who are two of the most aware linebackers, I think, of the nation. They're not the best in coverage. Um, Shaq and Pickney are really good at defending the run, obviously. Yeah, and they're going to be needed. Yeah, because you, for as sure. I said, if you defend this run enough, you should have these linebackers be aware enough to be able to play that RPO. And what really benefits the linebackers too is their our front four is yeah. really really good. Yeah. Well, the front seven on Miami's defense yeah. is incredible. Well, I guess you would say front six because Miami yeah. doesn't play. Yeah, that's well, true. You can, you can count Romeo Finley. Front seven is probably. That's what I want to talk about. I think we'll we're gonna do something every week. We'll talk about what we think are what the best matchup for Miami is every week for this for the game that currently would happen. It's a for Miami's. It's Miami's front seven versus North Carolina's offensive line slash running game. Yeah. Because if Miami defends that run, then that RPO does nothing. And then you got Sam Howell, who in the fourth quarter is throwing deep balls one on one with receivers, and North Carolina, or South Carolina's corners are just playing it terribly. And I mean, yeah. I guess to Howell's credit, they are pretty good balls. But at this point, um, you just got to hope that Pickney and uh, Shaq can either play the RPO well enough, where our four defensive of linemen, who are incredible, who just didn't really need to play that well against 
Florida, but they ultimately they shut down uh, the Michael P. Ryan. To his yeah. To that credit, yeah, I mean, I think he had one decent play, P. Ryan. Yeah, he had like fifty something yards yeah, in that game. Run, yeah. And this is a guy that at the end of the season last year for Florida averaged like one twenty a game. So yeah. Um, so I guess you got to say that Miami was just obviously dropping back, making sure Franks couldn't do what he wanted to do. And uh, so I think we haven't seen the full scope of Miami's defense, but I really, uh, I really think they'll wind up doing a whole lot against North Carolina's offense because I don't think they're very good. Sam Howell, on the other hand, is a he can run, um, but man, this is Miami is not your average team. Because Florida, I think, is probably the best team defensively Miami will play all season. If Florida's very fast, they could match us in speed. But I don't think uh, – I don't think North Carolina's linebackers could really keep up with Miami's offense more on the opposite end of the spectrum. Nor can North Carolina's running backs outweigh Miami's front seven. So I think that's the the main it's, thing. It's tough to say. Yeah. Because um, you got players like linebacker Dominique Ross, um, who was suspended. Um, True. Also, cornerback Patrice uh, was suspended. Um, other than that, for for Tar Heels defense. Yeah, because Jake Bentley is not good at all for South Carolina, and they did a lot of concepts that were. Not foreign at all. It's just like running like flood concepts with the the steam going through the tight end through the middle, and you're just like it's one on one with the linebacker. He's playing cover three, so he drops down. You got your safety all the way on the other side of the field, and what we're really I, I we talking about the North Carolina's defense already, but um, what really what I think happens is their front seven is just not good. On defense. Yeah. Well, and As North we, Carolina's coordinator is Jay Bateman from Army now. Yeah. Both um, of these coordinators for uh, – the de- one defensive coordinator was currently – was already at North Carolina. And I think something was – they were ran out of money for a buyout or something, but he was there from the old staff. And uh, and then the guy they brought in from, the, from Army, they're co-defensive coordinators. And then you have Phil Longo being the offensive coordinator. These are two of probably the biggest – hot commodities when it comes to offensive coordinators other than the big names um, that were out there. Yeah, um, and uh, just to say, South Carolina, you know, North Carolina's defense against the Gamecocks, uh, they limited them to 270 yards while forcing two interceptions and totaling three sacks. Um, mm-hmm. Defense allowed South Carolina to convert just three of 12 third down opportunities. And also we got a chance to see the Tar Heels turnover belt. Have you seen that? Let me yes. show you a picture of it. I've seen it. I just want you to look at it again and show the camera your, your response. That's ridiculous. This is like WWE 1999. It's literally Alabama's. Miami wasn't the first one to do the turnover, Jane. But yet, in Miami fashion, we're always the one that everybody's compared to. Well, Miami does it best. I get, Yeah. I mean, Let's I would honest. say that. I would say that, yeah. Let's be honest. But Alabama was one of the first teams to really do a turnover item. And they, they just literally just copied what Alabama does, which is like a WWE belt. And they just give it to them. And it, it's – Oh, I, I forgot to mention. Uh, Tar Heels defense, Chaz Surratt oh, yeah, was the quarterback, quarterback and yeah. now he's playing linebacker. Yeah. Uh, we've also got uh, Jason Stowbridge, which was a three-star from – actually from Deerfield Beach. Yeah. Um, and then we talked about Patrice at corner, and but yeah, that's that's actually all I had, which they're kind of comparing uh, Chaz from quarterback to linebacker with uh, mm-hmm. Martell. Oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I think yeah. I've seen the exact article he's currently looking at. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Chaz played pretty well against South Carolina. South Carolina's running backs were terrible. Jake Bentley is not good. Um. So I don't know if North, North Carolina's game they played Saturday is honestly worth anything because South Carolina's not a good team. The same notion that Miami's game against Florida I don't think matters for this game either because, A, it was two weeks ago. 
Yeah. And then B, that was Florida. They're obviously the worst. They're the best team we'll play all season unless yeah. we make it to the championship game. Yeah. And and I think that's a good point too. Is okay. You've got Miami on a two week break. Mm-hmm. So you've got a fresh Miami to practice all the mistakes, mm-hmm. which Manny Diaz, you know, talked to the O line, talked to Jaron. Mm-hmm. And they've worked out the kinks. Well, the big thing, because we recorded our post-game one on Monday. Yeah. Um, right after, or right as we were filming it, they did their kind of, not initial reactions, but their take a breath. Yeah. What happened in this game. And Dan Enos was criticized very heavily for he basically said that Jaron Williams lost us that game against Florida. Yeah, I heard that. And – a lot of people hated it, and I don't hate it at all because if you watch, like, some of the film that people had you know, of the game, like, of the stands, you had people running wide open, and you have the moment a Gator was in the backfield, Jaron had his eyes down, and he was looking to go. And he keeps his head up. He could have made all of the throws that were wide open. So I would honestly say half of those sacks were Jaron's fault. Yeah, he held the ball too long. Which Enos, as a coach, said they were all his fault, and the game was essentially Jaron's fault. No, nah. well, the game was Johnson's fault. Whose fault? Uh, I forgot. Jeff name. Thomas. Yeah, that's true. That's a yeah. But if you, you guys really get that, you you catch that pass in the end zone, mm-hmm. you win the game. True. There's if we don't muff that punt, we probably win the game. We don't go for it on fourth down. We probably win the game. Yeah. And we kick a field goal instead. But if you watch, you got Jaron, who's not very confident. It's all, it's his very first start ever. And so if there was a game that if we were going to lose in this season that I had to pick which one we were going to lose, I would have said Florida, without a doubt, heartbeat. Yeah. Like, I would have just – if you did just off the top of my head, first team you're going to lose, you're going to lose one game this season. Who are you going to pick? I would say Florida. Yeah. Because after that – I mean, we got two weeks. This either destroys our team or we're infinitely better for it because our yeah. our two tackles can only go up. They cannot be any worse than they were other than <laughs> wow. there is a reality where they're worse, <laughs> but they literally cannot get any worse. You've got to get better, and this really determines what you've got as a team. You either got your work cut out for you if we lose this game or – this is a springboard that propels this team to. Yeah, be and I think good. that's the big point that I want to make is they've had two weeks off. They were week zero. They had so much pressure going into that game because it's the biggest rivalry they face. Mm-hmm. And now they have two weeks off. They have time to go over everything, clear their heads, come fresh into this game. The only other thing that I worried about was Hurricane Dorian. Yeah. With all the players' families being right on the, the coastline, well, some of them, mm-hmm. um, you know, then you've got players taking their mind off the game because they're worried about their families. Mm-hmm. Um, and then now the Hurricanes, you know. Well, that's the benefit Carolina. of having two weeks, I guess. Yeah. Which, uh, <laughs> last reason we don't have, a, we didn't have another podcast yeah. from this week earlier was yeah. also because we we live in Florida. So, and that sucker with the moment was coming like right at us. And then, you know, then it was here, and we had tropical force winds, and yeah, which wasn't really much. But hey, and and still. Manny Diaz basically said, um, this is what he said in his press conference: "We didn't miss a day or a practice. We had to make some adjustments, and people on campus did a great job of communicating with us and making sure the safety of our players was first and foremost. Then you have to think about this: it was a hurricane that was heading for West Palm Beach, and all the players and families that it could have affected." with Palm Beach County to Duval to the southeast part of the country is dramatic. Um, He also says we are not happy that it didn't come here because it is a storm that devastated the Bahamas, but it was on our minds. Yeah. So I don't know if some of these players have family members in the Bahamas. Um, I don't know if many Bahamian players on our team. Um, So I, but I don't think that will be much effect on this weekend's game. The only thing I would have, a caveat to that would have been that they don't get as much preparation time. But you also, you you get the benefit of having two weeks. So, I mean, you would hope with Manny being from Miami and from South Florida 
Yeah. He would say, this is hurricane peak time. We're going to over-prepare in the sense that we don't look under-prepared because yeah. of something, which is what happened to Miami in uh, 2018 where they had the hurricane come through and they had to play. They literally had no bye weeks. That year they went to number two in the ranking. Oh, and uh, they literally right. played – they got one game canceled with Arkansas State because of hurricanes. And they literally had no bye weeks the whole season. That was week two. And so from week – Two essentially because they didn't they didn't really play the game. So week three, throughout the whole season, they didn't get to have a bye week. So you it just, obviously helped them. Yeah. So this Miami doesn't necessarily count as a bye week, but it is because yeah. they move their game, their game forward. So what I really look for Miami to do on offense, man. Uh, you got to get Jaron on to – you got to get him in a good mindset or something because you can't – You people were saying – this was – I was going to say about the Eno's comment, I forgot. Is people were saying they're tearing this kid down. They're He's beating him up. And I thought that was a little soft of people to think. I think it's good for him. Because it's very Nick Saban-esque if you really – Yeah. Because, I mean, it, while he was at Alabama, this is very much a – Nick Saban asked, like, this is a business. Like, if you don't play well, somebody else will play well. well yeah, I mean, it's like they're trying to prepare these kids for the NFL or yeah. whatever else in life, and they're trying to instill stuff in them. And it's like you get people like Mac Brown that it's kind of like, oh, I just want the players to have a good time. Mm -hmm. And it's like you have Miami's entire staff wanting you at the end of the day to be better people. Yeah. You know, no matter what you do, they want you to give 110%. That's the feeling sure. I get. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, Jaron was under a lot of pressure, and I think the criticism from the coaches is what's going to make him Because they even shine. interviewed him. They even interviewed Jaron. Like, yeah. what do you think about Enos' comments? He's like, well, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. He agreed. Like, what am I supposed to be like? Yeah, he was right. Yeah. He's like, I missed guys wide open. He said I had a very uh, – astute tendency to when the pocket broke down, I kept my eyes down trying to get away. He said, I need to keep my eyes down. He said, that's what he's been working on all week. Yeah. And that's what my key to this game would have to be. Can he keep his eyes downfield and get guys like KJ, Jeff, Brevin, Will, Pope, Harley, Dallas, all those pass catchers. Can he get those guys into positions to make plays, which they apparently, from what people were saying, because they – we only have the TV view from the side, so apparently yeah. from the back end, which all the coaches get, they're saying dudes are wide open. Like, he's just running when he doesn't have to, A, run, or when he doesn't, A, have to run, and then, B, he, you know, there was nobody even near him. Yeah. Like, he's just freaking out because that was what was happening the whole game. Yeah. And uh, so I think that's the key. He said he was working on keeping his eyes downfield, trusting his linemen more, which is going against Miami's defense – which even if it's not the first team, Miami's pass rushers are insanely deep. Like there's – our second and third string defensive ends could start at other schools, I would say. But – uh, Yeah, and I've got Diaz quoted saying, Jaron, like all of the guys, is coming in and finding a, a way to better master what we ask of him. You know? Yeah. I think so, you also see what the, uh, what the defining factor was between the quarterbacks, why this was such a close race for so long is that you got Kosey who had a good arm and he can kind of make decisions. You had Tate who had a terrible arm, but they said he always knew exactly what to do, always kept his eyes downfield. And then you have Jaron who literally can make every throw, but at times had lapses in his judgment. So I think that's a pretty big key on offense is how he does. Um, then I think the second one is Jeff Thomas because of – this joker doesn't come back to play, like play and ball out. Yeah. He can he can go way down in Miami's fans' eyes. Yeah. Um, because Justin already hates him, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, with good cause. Yeah, because he quit on the team. Yeah. And but you can you can say well, our receiving coach was bad, which he apparently he was. But you can all say the same thing about Jaron. Jaron said he was transferring, then oh, two days later, 
later, he's like, yeah, no, never mind. So uh, if he doesn't have a good game, I don't know what's going to happen because I can see his coffin is getting shot. Because you could tell he had a really tough time with the way the first game went against Florida. Yeah. And um, another one, uh, off the tackles are going to be a big question for the rest of the season because <laughs> – John Campbell at right tackle. Say, was, I don't even want to talk about the O line for Miami. Yeah. It's just well, I do have Manny Diaz saying, uh, to me they are just improving and getting better. There's the dynamic. Uh, he says that I won't read that. Uh, we have to push back from the idea to say that this is just a problem. There was not a position group or anybody that had a U on their chest that doesn't have an opportunity to improve from Orlando. Yeah. So I mean, Manny has a. a a great experience with blaming everybody. Yeah. So he's just like, everybody needs to improve. Well, but he's uh, – go ahead. Well, he said that – he was something he may, he may have said too. I think it was that same interview. He said, I don't think anybody, any group, position group did enough to help us win the game. Yeah. yeah. And so you got on one hand, everybody's like, he's calling out the quarterback. Enos is calling out the quarterback. And then you got Diaz like, I'll raise you. And I'll call out everybody. Like yeah. our position group. Everybody made an error that could have helped us win that game. Everything from kicker, who missed a field goal, to a punter. Oh, I want to talk about that. Special teams on both sides. For North Carolina and Miami? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't I just, know much. I want to know your thoughts. Go ahead. I have uh, – I spoke too soon. I think it was last year, the first half. Miami, which we were going to talk about the, the game anyways. Um, what was it, the first half? Four field goals? Let me see. I have the, the plays For here. For North Carolina? Yeah. Yeah, first quarter, uh, Freeman Jones, 22-yard field goal. Then DJ Dallas gets a run. And then, uh, oh, you know what? I'm thinking of a different game. I'm thinking of the Gamecocks. Oh, uh, yeah. I do remember that because I watched yeah. the – the yeah. game this morning, they uh, they would run. drive, they would that. run the ball down the field, and then Howell would essentially not put them in good spots to make plays. Yeah. And because with Howell, he's a freshman, you take his first read away, he's going to start to panic, as does Jaron. And, you know, we, we know firsthand what would happen if you take your first read away. So there's that. But we'll talk about the 2018 game a little bit. Although I don't think it's necessary to – don't, I'm not going to try to draw any correlation between last year and this year. Um, but Yeah, they're completely different teams. I would just say it's just it's it's still, just something. It's to, still good to talk about. Yeah, because I think Miami's defense as a whole is almost the same. So, uh, well, we'll talk about Miami's offense last year because we only threw for like 125 yards, but we only threw 10 passes. And which just we'll just start it off like this. North Carolina turned the ball over six times. We scored three defensive touchdowns off of it. Yeah. Two were fumble returns. It was one nasty. was an interception. And so Miami had good field position pretty much the whole game. And so our offensive numbers are not fantastic. And also Dallas and Homer were going crazy that game. Yeah. Um, Dallas ran for I think almost one twenty. Yeah, Homer, 114, 11 carries. Yeah, and then touchdown. Homer ran for 88, almost 90. And uh, so, yeah, uh, that was just another – that's just – it it correlates systemically as to what was happening with Miami that whole season. We were throwing terribly. We were running the ball like maniacs. Which, yeah. It, but it's also the numbers are a little skewed because we didn't really play a game on offense. We were just – we were there for defense – because I remember I was at that game and the turnover chain came out the sixth time. And then all the Miami fans are like, man. Yeah. Like, I don't think we should keep playing this game. Because we won, what, 40? It was nasty. Was it 40, 47, 47 to 10? 14. 47 10. 47 10. Yeah. They ran a big touchdown, right? The very first touchdown was them? Yeah, it was DJ. Well, I no, remember. DJ Dallas. They had four plays, 75 yards. They didn't score the first touchdown? They did, but it was just a four yard run. But they, they had oh, they plays. ran, yeah. they ran like a sixty yard run. Yeah, because I remember because we were the. We, I like to sit in the end zone because it looks better, 
And so we would sit there at the end zone, and they ran the opposite way. And I was like, man, this game could be terrible. And then by the time the sixth turnover chain came out, I was like, okay, I think we could just call this game and go home. But we did, we don't leave games early. I would like to call that out. We don't leave games early. Yeah, yeah. I, I will say that I, I think that they watched Miami, Florida the whole way through. We Yeah, probably, yeah. Well, yeah, we had to because yeah. it was a close game at the end. Yeah. Yeah. But we watched. I, I don't like leaving. Early, that's all. That's just something I. I used to go to games with my uncle, and we never left early ever. It didn't matter if we were playing Bethune Cookman, and we were up seventy to nothing. He just, we just didn't leave early. But it, clock hit zero. Stadium, well, I guess rightfully so, because the stadium would be empty that game. Yeah. And then it would just be us. Yeah. Leaving, there'd be nobody in the parking lot, nothing like that. But yeah, we never. It didn't matter how hard we got beat, and I know this, but. When the last Orange Bowl game, we definitely didn't leave early. That game we lost like 50 to nothing. Like I think it was 48 to nothing. And we definitely did not leave that one early. But, um, but yeah, I guess with – I think really must talk about last game – or the last season's game because it was, it was just pure dominance on defense from Miami. Um, what was the Miami that we're used to seeing yeah. defensively? Yeah, for sure. Um, and Kosey Perry didn't have a fantastic game, but – He threw eight for ten. DJ Dallas. You know. Yeah, if he doesn't have a good game this time, I think DJ Dallas will wind up being – I think I said this last time. He'll be our most critical player. If he doesn't do well, I mean, we got a freshman quarterback and he put us in his backpack and take us to victory. I guess we'll have to wait and see if that game ever happens, but uh, – Pretty sure it would just be DJ Dallas ultimately running us into every game, and the win kind of what he did against Florida. Yeah, he well, kept I, mean, us I think the mix game. between DJ and Brevin. Yeah, Brevin's a good one. Yeah, yeah. you guys have a, you know good options there. Um, so this isn't really on the the schedule, but what's your prediction for the game? Yep. Hmm. Man, I here's the thing. Defense always sort shores up anything about offense you may have a question about. So just like last season when we had six turnovers, they made our offense look really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. But uh, – Yeah, I because, say, I mean, looking at the yardage, Miami had 354 yards. UNC had 329 yards. Well, they, used, they typically – they had the ball the whole game almost. Yeah. But, I mean, they drove the ball, but yeah. Miami just stopped them. Every time. Yeah. But I think it'll ultimately wind up. I think Dallas had a fumble in that game, too, and P- Kosey had a pick. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Kosey did have a pick. Um, I would say 31-10. 38-10. Hmm. I think it's going to be close. I don't think it will. I don't know if Miami's going to show up. Either Miami loses or Miami wins big. Uh, I know it's like, well, what else could happen? Miami could not loop, win close. It's just not in this team's DNA. Because that showed against Florida. They, we have too many young people making, trying to make quick decisions. I'm not sure we're there yet to make the plays to win us a close game. Because we had the chance. We don't muff the punt. Who knows what happens? We don't go for it yeah. on fourth down. Yeah. We kick it. We don't have to try to score a touchdown at the end of the game. We don't miss the kick. We don't miss a field goal. Then we probably don't have to, you know, and then going forward at the end or what, you know, it's just like there's all these things that just compound into barely losing against Florida. So I think if Miami either finds their identity with the help of the defense and they soar big or they'll just lose. Yeah, I, I'm going to go ahead and say that if the defense doesn't show up Saturday, mm-hmm. you guys are done. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because I don't That's think Miami can get into a shootout with any team with how questionable this offensive line is on the, at the outside. Yeah. Because North Carolina doesn't have anywhere near the pass rushers or the corners that Florida had to really, you know, because Florida's very press man heavy, I've said this, yeah. and they're going to make sure their defensive line gets back there and give them time. So Jaron came making quick throws, and that's ultimately what they did to beat us. 
and I don't think North Carolina can hang with us at all in that regard. And so we either find our footing with Dallas and Jeff and our tackles become sturdy because they both – I don't know if you know this, but Brian McKinney was an offensive tackle for Miami during 2001. He is one of only four offensive tackles in the history of college football to receive Heisman votes. Are you serious? Yes. He received a vote for the Heisman. Wow. He gave up – well, I told you, Miami only gave up two sacks – all yeah. of 2001. Yeah. So he gave up no sacks. That's pretty sick. He was also like 6'8", 240, or that's 340, like, I mean. That's like the dream of every OT yeah. to ever ever like, play the game. It, but he, on Insta, or on Twitter, was breaking down both tackles on certain plays and, like, what they were doing wrong. And he put out, he said, I would like to extend an offer to both tackles. I'll be in Miami on this day. If you guys want to meet, we'll talk. And they both agreed. They both commented on his on his Twitter and said, "We will meet. It will work on it." Wow. And Brian McKinney said they jumped up three notches, if, whether that's just him pounding his own chest or whatever. But Brian McKinney's a Miami Hall of Famer, so I don't think you. It's like Jeremy Shockey, NFL career. It's good, but I mean Miami career. You don't you don't say no to Jeremy Shockey or to you know. It's Miami at the end of the day. You don't say no to anybody that's been there and knows what to do. So I think that, like I said, if, if Miami's defense doesn't show up, I think the Tar Heels have a decent offense. They got a good enough offense. They got they a good enough. Run. They can run. Um, but Miami has a very astute history of dr- shutting down people's running games. Yeah. They no. play Georgia Tech for crying out loud every season who runs the triple option, and they beat them every time that they've had Pickney and Shaq. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, though, with, with the game against Florida, which we talked about, they should have recovered from their mistakes in these two weeks. Mm-hmm. But the missed tackles, yeah, um, you know, dropping punts, dropping balls, mm-hmm. if they can recover from missing tackles and the defense getting in there, getting the turnover chain – you know, getting the swag back, getting the, the mindset back, mm-hmm. then they destroy Carolina. Oh, I think so, yeah. But, but this, it all hinges. This game is a very much a trend setter for what happens throughout the rest of the season. Yeah, and it also uh, puts Manny Diaz on the hot plate. Yeah. I, think. I don't know if he'll ever be let go. No. I'm just saying, though, if, if Miami loses this game, it puts Manny in a very bad position. Yeah. Not that they'll let him go, but that he's going to be angry. Yeah. He's going to be, like, mm-hmm. angry. He's got a lot of mad fans, too. But I, it's just – I think – I've heard some Miami fans be as confident about this game as I've seen them be confident about one. But, I mean, my lifetime, there's – I can't really be confident about a Miami team. Yeah. We, we haven't had a good Miami team my whole memorable – Life. Yeah, since you've been watching the games. Yeah. yeah. So. Or going to because yeah. you've been to how many games? Since I was eight, eight yeah. or nine. I'm 24. You've had season passes. Yeah, we were – it was right as we stopped being good. So, that was around 05, 06. I started going. So, I'd have been 10, 11. I've yeah. been going pretty much every year since I was 20 – I'm 24 now. Yeah. Um, we I think we missed like two seasons of Al Golden which was rightfully so, but this is one of the first years we haven't been. Again, I haven't, I didn't get to go this year. We haven't been this season in a while. Yeah. So, but, yeah, I mean, if nothing else, this is a great rebuilding season. Mm-hmm. Um, gives Jaron some experience for next year. Yeah. Um, I'm this gonna is a give very it to winnable the, game. I'm going to give it to the Tar Heels. Really? Yeah. Not by much. Just by a little bit. I'm going to say fourth quarter, the Tar Heels are going to come back. No, I don't think so. I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's 38 to 10 or 31 to 10, something around there. I don't know. I don't with, think they with, score more than one touchdown. With it'll both be, teams, new programs, new it'll mindsets. Be a, it'll be a garbage touchdown, too. It'll be 31 3 most of the game. Maybe. That's not even like my confident Miami. That's just what I think. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's not that's not Tyler bragging. That's his. Yeah, that's just his bragging normal like, confidence. He would say seventy something to yeah. to three. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna give it to the Tar Heels. I'm gonna go with the Tar Heels on this one. I'm feeling confident. Um, in the new coordinators, I, I I don't feel very confident in Mac Brown. Yeah, I don't think so. He, he's just like know. a a cool grandpa. Yeah, I think he. Uh, I think there's place there's a spot for both. Ways that you know how contrasting him and D- Manny are. There's definitely a spot for both of them and yeah. their styles, at least in the modern game. But I don't know if it holds your players accountable enough. You know, like you could say, "Oh, behind closed doors and all that stuff," but it's like if if he's just like barely getting pressured behind closed doors to be better, he's gonna somebody's gonna grow complacent at some point. I think that's what Clemson really does a good job of is holding accountability behind closed doors, you know, and pressuring them, the players into being good. So, it's, yeah. can he do that at North Carolina with a group of three stars, um, which we all know Miami, with Miami fans, we know three stars don't aren't terrible. They're often some of the better players on our team. But, hey, yeah, if that's all you got, then. Yeah, it's, got, it's what you do with them is what makes the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about on either teams? Um, not really. I think I touched on most of what I wanted to say. Yeah. Did you? I, I know which were secretly Auburn fans. I'm not Auburn fan. He's an Auburn fan. I'm he, not. No. Secretly, he's an Auburn fan. No. Uh, but you you watched? I caught the second half. What do you think of the Auburn game? I think Bo Nix is better than people are giving him credit for. Um. Somebody says that he looked like a more competent Malik Rogier. I don't think he's that terrible. He's, um, it's Gus Malzahn's first game coaching or being the play caller again in quite some time. Uh, he definitely didn't do Bo Nix any favors, didn't give him any noticeable check downs, anything that came back across his face. You know, anything to really bail him out, it was all just like – it looked like Mark Rick's offense, to be honest. But this is also the same guy that won the Heisman with Cam Newton. So – or made Cam Newton win the Heisman, I guess you could say. So, uh, I think they played good. I don't think they deserve to win. But, hey, so is – such as college football. Yeah, and then uh, what else do we have? Let's see, tomorrow – I'm probably going to watch the Texas A&M Clemson game. Uh, yeah, that's a – oh, wait, that one's at 8, isn't it? Because Miami plays at 8. 3.30. Oh, really? Well, I'll probably watch that one then. Hopefully I have this on Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, they, they don't start. Uh, Alabama's playing New Mexico State. That could be exciting. They destroyed Duke. Jerry Judy. Their receiver is a maniac. Look out for Jerry Duke. He's my sleeper to win the Heisman. Ooh, LSU's playing Texas. Yeah, there's a couple of good games in the uh, – Florida's playing UT Martin. I don't know. Tennessee <laughs> said the same thing. Which uh, Florida did drop down to 11th, and Miami is – I'm surprised Miami's not ranked, are they? Nah, they just – Nobody likes us. It don't matter. <laughs> I know Miami fans throw this beak fit all the time, bro. But we're not being ranked like we're supposed to. You know, there's a big conspiracy that when kids commit to Miami, they get downgraded on the recruitment <laughs> sites. Honestly, I wouldn't doubt it. Which they – there's a very good case of two of those recently. One, the running back, Don Chaney, was a five-star, commits to Miami, drops down to a four-star. Like, I don't know. Okay. But because they're like the most hated. If it's just, it's just, if you're a Miami fan, just realize nobody likes us. That's other true. Other than Miami fans. That's true. I There's mean, not a sympathetic bone in anybody's body for Miami. Because no. it'll be like Alabama, like, oh, I mean, I kind of like Texas, or, and they don't like Auburn, obviously, but they're like, eh, you know, I kind of like Michigan, or, but Miami, it's like, Miami, like, no. Don't like Miami. Nobody does. 
So because Miami's the type of team that they'll lose the game, but then they'll meet you in the park a lot and say, "I bet yeah. you if we fight, we won't lose," and then yeah. they'll beat you up. Like I, I forgot to bring up that after the Florida Miami game, uh, <laughs> the Florida band director got put in a headlock by a Miami fan. That wasn't even true. They don't even know it's a Miami fan. No, they don't know it's a Miami fan. I just read the article. Sources say that it may well, have been Well, of course a they're going to say it's a Miami fan. And I wouldn't put it past them. I'm just going to say. Why would, else would it, why would it be a Florida fan? Well. I'll why would a Florida say. band director say, yeah, some kid from my own school put me in a headlock? What was he from Saskatchewan, Canada? He's not an idiot. <laughs> okay. We, we have no problems <laughs> with Canada, okay? I uh, mean, like, Canada doesn't know a lot about college football. This guy's a smart kid. He knows, oh, how can I get money? I'll say it's a Miami fan. Then everybody else will say, you know what? I didn't even see him. <coughs> but apparently he was pushing people over, pushing women out the way because all he wanted was his band to march in that line and nobody else could realize. Oh. Apparently this is a big thing that happens at Florida. They do this, like, thing where they march from the stadium to the bus. And, like, apparently they march in, like, sections. And some guy and his wife said that he was a Florida State fan. And he was, like, walking across. And, like, the band director, like, grabbed his wife and, like, threw her off to the side because she was trying to walk through the path. He's like, there was nobody there but just one guy. And said that, you know, this is a Florida State fan. So I doubt he would necessarily lie. But he said that, you know, it's a pretty bad thing that happens at Florida because this is apparently a big tradition whatever but um, it's very comical that they would just eh, it's probably a Miami fan I wouldn't doubt it it was a Miami fan oh okay it, here we go Yeah, I exactly. didn't say that at all I just said there's no proof that it's not a Miami that it is a Miami fan oh the proof is in the pudding whatever dude do you see the unsportsmanlike call on uh, Alabama yeah no wait oh, oh Nick Saban yeah, I forgot what the first one was about. Um, it was, uh, oh, the first, yeah, that's right. There was two uh, unsportsmanlike conducts in the same play. My, Alabama got a turnover, and the coach brings out the turnover belt, and he's, like, jumping and bumps into the ref. Yeah. And he's, like, kind of on the field. The ref turns around, stares at him, and after, like, five seconds throws a flag. And he had went on the field. He realized he bumped into the ref and backed up, and, he sta- and the ref staring at him throws a flag. And Nick Saban then comes out and gets a flag <laughs> thrown on him. And he basically said, if you don't want us to have fun, then why are we playing football? Yeah. Which I could see that because, like, especially as a Miami fan where that's, like, a big part of the culture of Miami right now, it's the turnover chains and the touchdown rings, is, come on, just let us have fun. Like, well, fine, we won't dance on the field, whatever. But once we get past our sign lines, let us do whatever we want. Like, he's like, sorry, I bumped into you. And he's like, I guess you could say that kind of is a flag, but it's like at the end of the day, homie. Yeah. Just like, we're all 18, 19, 20-year-old kids. Just let us play football. Yeah. Anything else? I think that's it. Uh, I think we've covered everything we can. Oh, did you see that North Carolina reporter, what he said? I'm going to pull this up. You'll have to cut it until I find it. One minute, five seconds. Or an hour, five seconds. We'll cut. I found it. So, this is a Inside Carolina. This is written. I'm going to say who it's by. It's by Kill Devil 3. K-I-L-L-D-E-V-I-L 3. He says, Miami is a lot like South Carolina in that the strength of the, of the defense is the D-line. Our offensive line held especially late. You could tell conditioning has improved. Sam is the real deal. Once they let him throw deep, it was over. UNC has a balanced attack. Miami always lacks discipline. When things get tough, they start to blame each other and play frustrated, leading to more mistakes. M- more mistakes. Special teams is the only place Miami always has a clear advantage. UNC gets up early. Miami will quit. That's the problem with filling a team with thugs, which is a nice word for brats. They quit when things get tough. 
What? Who wrote that? I don't know. This looks like it may have been a message board. But I would just like to point out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every Miami player saw this. Did they? Because the first person that saw it, DJ Dallas. Oh, boy. And you know who the leader of Miami is right now? DJ Dallas. DJ Dallas. That's not good. So everybody retweeted DJ Dallas, who had posted this, and said, okay, let's ride. Okay, I'm going to recant. <laughs> I knew you were going to. Uh, Tar Heels winning? Uh, wow. That's the why fuel would you, on the fire. That's the fuel that? that Miami needed. When did that come out? Um, or when did DJ tweet it? Last week sometime. Okay. No, I think it was right after they beat South Carolina. I don't know. It's been a long week Yeah. with the hurricane. We've been, like, sitting at the house for, like, three days. So it's been a long week. But I think it was around – it was somewhere around – it had to be after South Carolina because he had facts about the South Carolina game. So um, That's not good. But, yeah, if you – that's just – man. That's dumb. Uh, this is also the same North Carolina team – that got in trouble for finishing their players' homework, the teachers would, <laughs> and write their own papers. <laughs> DJ Dallas said DJ, it show the camera. cover photo. On Twitter, DJ Dallas' background slash cover photo is the exact. I'll throw it up here somewhere. It's circled in, with a big green marker. The last part I said, which is Miami is a bunch of thugs, and they will quit. When they get down, they will start blaming each other. So on, so on, and so forth. Mm. That's not good. (laughs) That's not good. (coughs) Um, I'm so mad I forgot about that. Oh, the game sold out. Yeah, it's a... It's home game for Tar Heels. Blackout, whatever. It's sold out. Yada yada yada. It's okay, basketball well, school. I'm gonna give DJ Dallas props because he's he's quoting Deuteronomy. Does he really? <laughs> On Twitter two days ago, be strong and be brave. Do not be afraid of them because the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you <laughs> nor forget you. Deuteronomy thirty one six. <laughs> Holy cow! Uh, mm. Miami seventy to three, uh, taking the game. Told you thirty one ten. Uh, That's a realistic one. Thirty eight ten. It's gonna be nasty. If that changes everything. Yeah, it does because. DJ, DJ Dallas is your MVP. He's your leader. Yeah. yeah. He fills the hole that Jaron can't necessarily fulfill being a freshman. This is. You see that? That's pretty sick. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> DJ Dallas is also the same guy that was in the studio with Solo D, who made the Turnover Chain song. Have you ever heard of that? No. no. You ever heard of the Turnover Chain song? We'll have to check it out. He's making one about the. Uh, touchdown rings. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. This is probably just some random hillbilly on the message boards, but it definitely got popular enough because when whoever sent it, whoever, however DJ Dallas found it, well, it, it said like it was posted like six months ago or six Sean, minutes ago. Sean Harvey shared it, and DJ Dallas just retweeted it five right, days ago. Yes, that is right, yeah. I remember that now. So this is one of like Miami's like fans retweeted it, and somehow it got the back to Dallas, and Dallas retweeted it. Yeah, and he lives in North Carolina. The guy that tweeted it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's him. Yeah. No, this is the guy that tweeted it. That DJ Dallas retweeted. Oh, it's a Miami fan that lives in North Carolina. Yeah. Well, that's neat. <laughs> that's neat. I mean, Hopefully, he's at the game. So yeah. obviously, Miami wins the game. <laughs> What do you think it does? Does it move them up? Because, no. you know, Tar Heels not ranked at all, so. No, there's no love for Miami, so. I don't ever expect Miami to be ranked or move up or. That's just, at this point, it's like part of the DNA. It's just, you're like, oh, Miami played really well. Do you think they'll move up? Probably not. But it is what it is. Yeah, the, really the game I want to see is on the Florida side is Florida, Georgia. Yeah, that's a ways out. Yeah, yeah, it's towards the end. But Boise State got the win. There was a lot of upsets week one. I was surprised. Yeah, 
Florida State was up big, 33 points, and Boise State came back and beat them. <laughs> Hashtag keep Willie Taggart. Uh, Florida State's a joke right now, man. Yeah. I don't understand what happened to you guys. But, hey. You just uh, you throw an L and you just do that. <laughs> I'll let him do that one. That's it. That's all you do. You just throw the L. Well, you got anything else you want to talk about? I think that's it. Uh, I'm, st- I'm, a- I'm still going to go with the Tar Heels. I was just kidding. Really? Yeah. Well, what's your score then? I think it's close. I think it's in the 20s. I want to score though. Mm, I'll say 24. I don't think it's going to be a high-scoring game. I'll say like 17, 13, something like that. Nice. Okay. Well, If they played like they played week zero, I'm going to say like 17. Oh, 13. yeah, for sure. I would say Miami scores that. But I will say I don't know if Miami can win a game like they did with like what happened with Florida where they have to go down and score. I think yeah. they can win close in the sense that they're up and Miami's defense has to stop them. I think Miami can win like that. But I don't think it could be reversed where Miami has to drive down the field and win the game. Yeah. Unless it's a field goal. If it's a touchdown, I don't see that really happening. Yeah, and then, you know, what's his name? Uh, Miami's kicker, Bubba? Yeah, Bubba Baxa. Had, had one, one miss. Yeah. But uh, He's a sophomore. I mean, it happens. North Carolina had a, a block. Actually, yeah, they blocked the kick, yeah. Or wait, or did no, South their, Carolina? their kick got blocked. That's right, yeah, because they yeah. were starting. I remember hearing that they started a new long snapper, holder, and kicker. Yeah, they've completely revamped. Mac Brown said he completely revamped special teams. Yeah. So, this is a completely new team. Yeah. And the Gamecocks game wasn't that good. I yeah. don't know what whoever that guy is is talking about, but the Gamecocks did not play like Miami. No, nor do I think this is even close, <laughs> personally. But uh, I think it just depends. I mean, I think it depends. I guess we'll have to see, because, I mean, this is all riding on Jaron. I think at the end of the day, you got Dallas who needs to have a good game. Jeff who needs to have a good game. But the other the day, this is Jeff or not Jeff, but Jaron. What does he do? Yeah. Does he play like he did against Florida? Because I don't think we'll win. We got Hal too. It's the same thing on both teams. Freshman quarterbacks. How, I don't think Howell plays that well enough to. Well, I mean, they both have to step up. Oh, yeah, true. Um, we've got to see what they're going to do. You've got great running backs. Yep. Um, and it's going to depend on the defense. The uh, only thing different is North Carolina has a, a much better O-line compared to Miami's O-line. I don't much better. That's true. Much better. I don't think that's true much at all. Better. Much better. I think they have a better. I don't think they have better anything, honestly. They have no receivers, too. But well, another thing much I've heard. better. Maybe, whatever. Much better. Has some experience there. They have, other than Miami's interior three, they definitely have a better, better tackle pair than Miami's. But Miami's offensive line as a unit is probably way better. Okay, whatever. I completely disagree. I don't think there's a, a position on the field where North Carolina bests us. O line, for sure. Well, stick with your guns. We'll then. see. We'll see. I'm sticking. Are you the guy that wrote the post? <laughs> at this point, no, I'm not that stupid. Andrew's delusional at this no, point. No, I'm not that stupid. But to be fair, Andrew is not that stupid. I don't even <laughs> think that's a compliment. <laughs> Andrew would never do that. Andrew uh, would never. No, if anything, I would say something about Miami to try and boost their whatever to get them overconfident. Miami's never ventured into that range recently, I think, with their overconfident. No, no. I don't think you really can until... No, not with Manny Diaz. No. Breathing fire on your neck. Especially that, yeah. But, but yeah, that's... I think I've said all that I can say. Um, yeah. If you guys made it this far, let us know. We yeah. appreciate you guys spending the time with us, um, taking the time out of your day to watch us. Um, I know Tyler appreciates it because it's his show. It's got his name on it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm probably going to get replaced here soon. Uh, there's a long uh, line for my seat, so uh, yeah. 
I'm going to be like uh, FSU's head coach, and I'm out of here. It's just uh, these are people that don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so I would like to keep having Andrew on here at least because at least he researches it. And yeah. like my mom, for instance, that wants to come on here. Who just wants to come on here and talk about Auburn. So yeah. we're not doing that. But Yeah. Uh, this is still strictly the Miami podcast, and we're going to yeah. keep it that way. I'm a little worried about what I'll do in the off season once the season, but the season just started, so I guess we'll just wait and figure that out when it happens. But uh, yeah, I guess we'll have to talk about. But if you made it this far, please leave a like. Tell your friends because we're trying real hard. Yeah, I mean, and and we want this to get out there. We, you know, we're we're pouring a lot of time and a lot of passion into this. Tyler spends yeah. a, his most of his waking hours, you know, on ESPN. This is this is what he's yeah. planning on doing with his life. Um, so any support that you guys can give us actually really helps us. Um, you know, sharing, liking, commenting. If you have something to say, you know, if you have predictions, we want to hear them below. Um, share us on Twitter. You can add us on Twitter. We'll add uh, those, uh-huh. and you can. I don't, care don't at me, but you can I don't care if it's something stupid like Andrews <laughs> 17 or 13. Just I let me know. know. Let me know if I'm in the minority or if I'm with my fellow Miami fans and thinking that this should be a cakewalk. So, yeah. And as always, guys, uh, thanks for watching. And uh, well, yeah. what's our plan for next week? Um, we'll definitely release one probably on Monday. Well, well, at least record it on Monday. I would like to get it up on the same day. I know Andrew usually edits it, so that's what's a little rough. Is because I don't really know how to edit them, and Andrew does really good with it. So it's all up to Andrew. And I know he had like some internet problems. Yeah. So yeah. his internet's a little spotty. So I guess we'll. Either way, we'll probably record it on Monday, and then we'll preview it. We'll probably do Monday and Friday. That's what we'll just keep doing. Yeah. Um, preview, and then. This one got a little lengthy because, again, these are two – Miami's rebuilding, and then uh, North Carolina is completely different. So you have to talk about all the new stuff. And yeah. Yeah. then you basically have to, like, talk about the game last year and then basically say it means nothing. Yeah, there's so many variables so that it's – next week it's Bethune-Cookman from Miami. I don't know if we'll really talk about I have much. some things to say about Bethune-Cookman. <laughs> so if you, if you guys want to hear that, I've got some interesting st- – We'll make stores. one about Bethune Cookman, but it'll probably it'll just be a, an easy one. We'll probably just we'll find some other stuff to talk about. Yeah, that, maybe not football related or whatever. Yeah, in that one that might be a shorter one because that um, one's a that one should be built to be easy. And that one might actually be you could probably do that as a solo. Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, for sure. That one might just be audio only mm-hmm. um, instead of video. So if it's not a real important game, we might just do audio only. Yeah. Um, I but we'll see. Tell us, tell us what you guys think. Yeah. If you like the video, let us know. If you, you know, want to hear some more audio, we're also going to be working on getting to uh, iTunes, yeah, uh, in their near future, and all of the other podcasting apps. You know, mm-hmm. Anchor, um, getting on the Play Store, stuff like that. Spotify, so. yeah, all of them. So yeah, for sure. Well, uh, thanks for watching, and FSU, here you go. <laughs> thanks for watching. Go Canes. Trio five. Yeah. Number eight. Dean Cannon. Yeah. Y'all already know what time it is. Throw them use up. Throw them use up. We gon' let the band deal with this. Yeah.